coming into horticulture and landscape design was almost an accident. Obviously, I wanted to draw. I loved drawing. I was good at drawing. Uh, I thought about architecture, but it was kind of too stiff for me. And the first year at college, the architects and the landscape architects worked the first year together. And I thought, well, landscape looks far more interesting. We were really that first generation, I suppose. John was before me, but certainly then after the war and uh, around about the 19, late 60s, early 70s, garden design was starting to take off and working with John Brooks as well on the domestic scene, seeing his gardens, working on his gardens, drawing his gardens. Uh, that was a terrific experience. Uh, and that just led from one thing to the other. And I, I've never looked back really. I, I, was, I, I got the bug, as people do with gardens and design and all things horticultural. I mean, what a wonderful life. Inspirations come from everywhere. And it's a thing that you must never turn off. Um, I'm always slightly worried about people's design when it gets static, and I do say that to students. Never stop looking and getting inspiration. And inspiration changes over the years. It started certainly with art and architecture, then it moved into gardens. I've been involved with writing, and funny enough, meeting authors gives you a whole new spin on a perspective of life. It's, it's, it's an amazing business. Chelsea certainly drives, has driven a lot of my design thinking. Um, and for my sins, I was called the first celebrity gardener. I've never understood what that was about, but I learned so much um, of working at Chelsea and then working at Hampton Court and Tatton Park and all the others. And art's been a very important part of my design world. Certainly show gardens and more adult garden gardens have been pure art, and I just think there's nothing wrong in that. I think heroes are, are always important. Anybody who hasn't got a hero, it's a bit sad, really. You've got to have something, must have something to drive towards and to look up to and get experience from. In garden design terms, the West Coast of America and Tommy Church and Garrett Ekbo and uh, Dan Kiley and all those people who really revolutionised the way that we were looking at gardens. It's not necessarily the most expensive gardens that you're most proud of, but I think the one I'm most proud of was the one that I never designed, or never actually got built, it's the one that got away, which was a commemorative garden for Princess Diana. I've walked around that garden a thousand times. I'm immensely proud of it, it's never been built. I've designed a beautiful garden called Abbey Wood up in Cheshire, which is now actually open to the public, but that was a cracker. Uh, I've designed another garden uh, in Japan, in Gifu, uh, a, a rose garden, an English rose garden in Japan, which is stunning. I must admit the garden we're in now, it's a young garden, it's only three years old. I'm immensely proud of this garden and I'm proud of it because the client loves it and that makes it special. Well, the future of garden design is bright and it's always bright. I mean, the cup's always half full, never half empty. But I think the, the important thing is the environment he started to drive gardens, sustainability. The whole drive of gardens is going to change and we're going to be less emphasised on hard, slippery, shiny surfaces and expensive products and more on plants and planting and recycled and upcycled materials that can really make us feel more comfortable in where we live outside. The Lifetime Achievement Award is something else, isn't it? I mean, I could be all worthy and say, you know, I'm proud and I never thought it would happen to me. But you know what? I was chuffed as heck about it. <laughs> <laughs>